Hello all, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar to explore what is a transformational time for global infrastructure investing. I look forward to hearing the views of our panelists as we broach themes of digitalization, decarbonization, and deglobalization in the context of an evolving global infrastructure market. My name is Thomas Simmons. I'm a director and head of listed real assets research in the investments business at WTW. I'll be moderating this panel that has been convened thanks to our hosts, the Global Listed Infrastructure Organization, GLIO, and Wilshire Indexes. I'm joined today by David Bentley, partner at Atlas Infrastructure, Manoj Patel, Managing Director and Head of Global Infrastructure Securities at DWS, and Martin Howard, Senior Vice President in Index Research at Wilshire Indexes. As we go through today's discussion, please do submit questions as they arise and we will endeavor to address them during the time that we have, if not then after. So let's get into it. Manoj, in consideration of the digitalization and decarbonization themes evident today, to what extent are fundamental changes in technology impacting infrastructure allocations? Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Um, well, that's, you know, the, both decarbonization and digitalization is really where, where all the activity is happening on the infrastructure side. You know, we've, you know, historically, I think people have thought of digitalization as, you know, the, the investments and, you know, in, in telecom towers and, and data centers, and, and those are continuing. But, you know, what we've really seen in the last few years is just such a, you know, with, with whether it's, it's cloud or storage and then, and then now AI, you know, the significant need for more, more data centers. And so, so that obviously has driven a significant amount of investment on the data center side, both from corporates and, and from, from infrastructure investors. But as part of that, you know, what, what we're now seeing is just an incredible amount of power demand. And, you know, the conversations, you know, I think for the last several years have been obviously very focused on energy transition and how we're going to decarbonize um, because historically, you know, particularly in the U.S., you know, power demand was 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 wasn't really growing. You know, between you know, um, you know, between looking at at efficiencies um, and 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 just sort of lack of you know significant power demand. Um, power demand has been mostly flat uh, until a few years ago, and um, and what was just happening was was just the mix was shifting, right? Where you know, where you know, coal and maybe some other hydrocarbon based power. Sources where we're shifting towards, you know, renewable energy sources, and that's continuing to happen. But now I think what's what's really shifting is that um, it's not even about transition anymore. It's it's really about just energy addition. You know, the the incredible amount of of data and power demand um, that's needed uh, for these new technology applications is really driving just growth in in, in more energy. And while you know, I think. Renewable energy still gets, you know, a majority of, of I think the the capital and the development um, that that we're seeing in, in the market today. Um, it's starting to open up conversations about even just traditional sources of energy. And when people might have thought that, you know, oil and natural gas might be sort of withering, you know, over the next 20, 30 years, you know, there's a there's a good chance that, you know, you know, natural gas is going to be around for a very long time, not only to serve as as a bridge fuel, but but also it's going to be a much just needed, you know, um, just, just to maintain reliability of power um, and to, to, to offset sort of the intermittency of, uh, of renewable energy. So, so I would say that, you know, I, I think a big thing that, that really is, you know, the development of digital infrastructure assets is continuing. Um, it's in some ways moving exponentially on the data center side, but I, I would say where, where more, I think, activity is even happening is just on on power and, and energy infrastructure development uh, globally. Yeah, absolutely. David, uh, what are your thoughts on changes in technology impacting infra allocations? Um, I think maybe maybe to add to some of uh, to some of that, the there's been some interesting, um, I guess, on the on the. On the renewable energy technology side, um, we haven't seen kind of the same level of uh, sort of improvements in efficiencies and just just the general price decline that we had seen for a little while. So, you know, th those curves always start to flatten out, and we've definitely started to see that. So, um, and maybe to, to I guess to Manoj's point, 
it has meant that what we're starting to see is, you know, some of the optimism around the electrification and and really the pushing out of traditional energy is is really maybe some of that's coming off the boil. And, and you know, that's um, that's in, in a sense, that's um, that's a shame. But I guess there's just a reality that's starting to kick in uh, about, you know, the, the closer you come to uh, sort of, well, the, the, the more renewables you have in the in in your system, the incremental addition of renewables um, does become a little bit dif more difficult. Slightly offsetting that, um, where, one area where we have continued to see some very significant improvements in technology and just general price reduction uh, is on the battery side. Um, so there's there's both some sort of existing efficiencies and cost reductions that have come down, but we're also starting to see some new technologies coming through. Um, that potentially could significantly improve or reduce the cost of storage. So the I got to say the future is a little uncertain and, and some of the curves are that well the, dif the difference between like upside and downside of curves is still actually quite broad. Um, so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that balance between traditional energy and um, and renewables uh, grows over the next few years. Indeed, turning turning to the pace of that change, do you, do you think we should be seeing faster shifts to alternative energy generation? Um, we'd like to, <laughs> uh, definitely. You know, as as somebody um, with an environmental kind of bent, uh, that that would be ideal. the The interesting challenge that we're seeing, and it doesn't matter, you know, who you talk to, really, in the electricity sector. Interestingly, it doesn't seem to be a challenge of technology. Um, mostly it's actually the biggest impediment we're seeing is in planning and whether that's planning to get a new sort of uh new wind farm, farm approved like the offshore situation in new york has been um an unbridled mess uh you could say so that's i mean that's a great example of of, of some planning issues in combination with some some cost uh cost increases and you know we we met with um the head of edison international last uh, last week, and and he was sort of talking about some of the challenges that that they are having, and there's a combination of a huge number of a, a huge amount of um, approvals that are required for new connectivity, at the same time as you know that just in general the planning system is pretty sluggish, and as hard as people seem to be pushing it, the there is continual challenges uh, on a political side. Um, to sort of balance that consultation with the need of, um, you know, with the need to get get things done quickly. So the the bottleneck seems to be on the uh, on the planning side, and and whilst that remains a challenge, um, renewables are going to continue to just, you know, have some headwinds, I guess, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Manoj, do you um do, do you share do you share that view on the on pace of change and sort of perhaps more, more broadly in terms of the opportunity there? Yeah, no, I, I probably agree with with David's comments. You know, I think, um, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, well documented, you know, there's just significant like so interconnection queues, um, you know, renewable energy assets, particularly solar, you know, are very simple assets to build, you know, that's what partly makes them great. Uh, and, um, but, you know, as David noted, the, the, you know, just the administrative kind of challenges on the, you know, the planning side um, and as well as getting connected, you know, into the grid, you know, some markets, you know, particularly U.S. and, you know, parts of Europe that that's become a challenge. And probably one one further thing to add is that, you know, you, you are starting to see, you know, some impact of just, you know, you know, politics and, you know, sort of tariffs, you know, on foreign outsourced, you know, solar panels or other renewable, you know, energy assets. And so that, you know, that can obviously make things a little less efficient. Um, so, so the, you know, the development is happening. Um, it, it's quite robust, but it's going to be hard for it to scale up significantly from here just because of, you know, again, just just a lot of the, the challenges associated um, on the on the administrative side of uh, developing these assets. Yeah, I just um, I was just thinking uh, while Manoj was talking, one of the other things that we're starting to see is just the number of uh, there was some really interesting research the other day. The number of hours of zero market price electricity is 
you know, every, every year um, the number of zero hour or zero dollar meg per megawatt um, hours is, is sort of increasing quite exponentially. Now, it'd be interesting to see whether there are technologies that can take advantage of that. Um, but if there were technologies taking advantage of that, we haven't seen them kick in too much, I guess. Otherwise, that that sort of increase wouldn't we wouldn't be seeing that. But that becomes an increasing challenge for um, you know on the on the renewable side that that their actual the market price they're realizing as um, you know could be a challenge or, or even I guess in Australia for instance you're seeing some curtailments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and maybe just just as a point to that, you know where there is I think incredible amount of demand demand for alternative energy and if it can get built is if you can deliver continuous power. Um, mm -hmm you know, decarbonized continuous power, reliable continuous power, which, you know, frankly, right now, the only things that are available for that are, are nuclear and, and maybe, you, you know, some, some hydropower assets. Um, there's a lot of demand for that. Now, those are probably the two most challenging assets to develop. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so that's why you don't see, you, you know, that's why you're not seeing, you know, much development there, but um, from a demand standpoint, and particularly, you know, if you if you look at sort of the applications of, of data centers who, you know, sort of have sort of high demand needs, but on a continuous basis. Um, and obviously, many of these data centers want to want to source, um, you know, um, zero carbon or, or low carbon power. Um, you know, that, 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 you know, if, you know, if the market can sort of crack that code and, and being able to deliver that, um, you know, whether that's a combination of renewables and, and storage assets or, you know, possible ability to, to, you know, for maybe small nuclear, um, small modular or nuclear re reactors or, um, or, or maybe even on, on the hydro, uh, hydropower side. Um, that, that's, that, that's definitely an area that could, that could, you know, could increase if, if the opportunity is there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, changing tack um, a little bit, Martin, uh, given what we've covered so far and, and how, there's arguably a much broader um, subset of, of, of areas which, which private infrastructure investors invest in compared to those in the listed infrastructure space. How, how should an index take into account what is an evolving market and the varying definitions of infrastructure? Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question. So I think w one of the important things is to, to sort of understand what infrastructure is. And, and so from, you know, Wilshire Index's perspective, that's why we, we partner with Glio, for example, so we can understand the, the true nature of the market um, from, from a user's perspective. And so as part of that, we, we spent a long time creating um, the infrastructure sectors with Glio that we could then map to a traditional classification system that, you know, most people are familiar with. And I think what that allows then from an index perspective is, is a, a degree of dynamism that, that's perhaps lacking if you just use the ordinary subsector view of the world, um, because you, you're looking at it from an infrastructure perspective, you can then very easily amend that to what the view of the sort of infrastructure world and ecosystem is. So for example, we, we have a, a specific renewables um, subsector that you know captures part of what would traditionally be ordinary electric utilities, but you know, by ex excluding them from electric utilities and including them in renewables, you've been able to you know, sort of capture that change or that evolution within within the wider infrastructure world. Um, but I think on, on the technology side, that's a, an interesting piece, and I might throw a curveball there. So from from our perspective, you know, whilst there's you know all sorts of amazing technologies being used within infrastructure to create infrastructure, I guess we see the real change from technology as the through tokenization and in particular that of the, the private non-listed assets which i think our, our long-term view to the five ten years these will rapidly become investable within within the listed type of index um environment so i think for, for us that's you know that that's where technology you know that's the technology change that that we see um in, uh, coming on in the future yeah absolutely um and that, by definition, is is a is a global opportunity set, right? Um, yeah, that's right. Given, given the opportunity to to invest all over, but um, Manoj, you, you touched on this earlier. But to what extent are geopolitics influencing infrastructure capital deployment, and are we seeing 
supply chain onshoring taking place? And is that a, is that a tailwind for for infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, you look back just the last five years, you know, from COVID to, you know, some of the subsequent, you know, geopolitical conflicts we've had, you know, security, reliability, um, you know, has become just more paramount, you know, everything to governments around the world, you know, they want to be, you know, maybe just less reliant on, you know, serving the needs, uh, you know, of their communities. And, and I think, you know, it, having the appropriate infrastructure is 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 important right you know in order to to satisfy you know that and so you know it obviously depends on different parts of the world right uh, i mean i think in the us you know we were seeing a a significant sort of renaissance in sort of onshoring particularly in in, in the manufacturing industrial sector um you know and obviously in that in some ways got sort of turbocharged with with the, with the ira that was passed um the ira bill that was passed a few years ago um, and then, you know, and I think in other markets, you know, you, you, you know, the just having reliable, uh, secure energy um, and a secure energy source, you know, for their communities, um, you know, and I, I, I think is is become more paramount. And so, so you know, particularly in Europe, you know, you you know, you've seen you know a number of policy actions that that you know are have been in, you know been sort of enacted in order to you know help facilitate you know again. The, the, not only the transition, but to be able to to um, not be be less reliant on others for for energy sources. So, um, so so I would say this is happening across the world, both developed and, and emerging markets. Um, and and policy is a great tool, you know, to to help a- accelerate that. And and in all of these in all these cases, you're seeing a significant amount of private capital, uh, both from the, the from listed companies uh, as well as you know, from, um, you know, from the private side uh, being involved there. David, do you share that view? Is uh, is that a tailwind for infrastructure? I think it is. I think, um, yeah, I, Manoj makes really good points about so the supply chain security and, and the energy security that we're looking for. Probably the only thing that I could um, usefully add would be uh, also the fact that I guess, and this is particularly in Europe, but it probably goes to the US to an extent as well, um, it's an unfortunate consequence of some of the instability that we're seeing that governments are, governments whose balance sheets were already stretched are, are just having their their budgets further stretched by the need for for either providing aid or or actually even building up their military uh, capacities. And you know, in, a, in an environment where they are already stretched, the the amount of capital that governments have for the energy transition and any other any of those kind of things, um, that's well, firstly, from a priority perspective, that's sort of you know secondary, um, and so the need for private capital uh, is probably greater than ever, and it'll be interesting to see actually whether just the the current state of government balance sheets results in sort of you know uh, a further wave of uh, sort of public to private uh, or sort of you know, privatization of public assets. Um, you know we had quite a big wave uh, and sort of market liberalization you know 10, 20 years ago. Um, there's still quite a few assets you know and or assets that are partially held by governments and I'm interested to see whether they, whether there's any sort of shift in in that area as well. Um, But if I can just quickly um, move back to something that we talked about on the definition of infrastructure, if that's okay. Um, I thought that I thought the question on on the point on tokenization was fascinating. And I really need to go and read up on that. It it seems Um, I think it's really important that the um, that the hurdle uh, or the the sort of stringency we have for what we call or, or what kind of assets need to meet to, to sort of be infrastructure is, is quite important to maintain that. Um, we've sort of seen on the private market side that people have been willing to um, somewhat reduce the hurdle uh, for what is infrastructure. And it's been quite interesting to see some of those assets that have then creep, crept into being infrastructure. They're the ones that have got themselves into a bit more trouble uh, of late with rising capital costs and the like. Um, so whilst what we should do is make sure we keep a very, um, for, I guess for the for the, the, st- the stability of the industry and 
the uniqueness of the asset class, it's important that we're not just a defensive industrial um, sort of sector where actually infrastructure is provides a meaningfully differentiated investment opportunity. And so therefore, we need to keep the, the hurdle for what is infrastructure quite high. And as technologies kind of mature and as, um, you know, renewables or data centers, you know, once they get past a certain amount of, um, you know, footprint or, or maturity, then they can kind of move into into an index or into the into the definition. But basically, we shouldn't be trying to start moving the moving the hurdles down just so we can um, broaden the scope of investability. Uh, that I've, I feel you know, quite strongly about that. And so, David, do you, do, do data centres meet that hurdle for you today? <laughs> uh, a couple do. Um, okay. uh, the vast, I would say, the vast majority um, don't, and it's it's very much a um it's a case i mean there's so many there's a there's quite a few different sort of bit um sort of corporate structures and business uh approaches to the data center industry and so some of those are much more infrastructure than others some are quite real estatey and some are more industrial and some are more um infrastructure so yeah i would we, we have to be very selective in that in that area yeah, so, so on on that, from an index perspective, you know, we we thought very long and hard about whether to include data centers or not, and you, you know, they are they are an edge case. Um, I think there's still some view that, that they're, they're real estate, and some view them as, as infrastructure. Um, we we made the decision to exclude them um, from our sort of standard infrastructure universe, um, but you know, we do do have the mechanism by which we we could include them if you know if an investor wanted to to track that that element of the the sort of ecosystem but what about you and do data centers fall into your opportunity set yeah no i, th I think you know our view views are similar to to what david said you know i think there are you know there are data centers that i think kind of meet meet the definition of, of what we would consider infrastructure but you know a lot of a lot of data centers are just you know i would say specialty real estate right um and and it's a good business so it's nothing you know just because you don't think something's not infrastructure doesn't mean it's a bad business it's just it's just not infrastructure business right um and you know and, and you know as david noted you know you know we're seeing a lot of this strategy creep you know particularly things that are frankly just specialty finance um or kind of leasing structures um sort of pop up as as infrastructure and so uh so it, it is really important to to distinguish and um and and again, just because it's not infrastructure doesn't mean it's it, it's bad. It's just you know I, I think for investors, you know when they allocate to infrastructure, they, there's a certain expectation and that they that they want to see, and it's important that you know I would you know to David's point that the industry sort of broadly you know is consistent with that. You know the more it sort of broadens out, and I think you start to deal with challenges um, in terms of what what exactly is infrastructure delivering you know to to people in their portfolios if 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 the definition is is so wide and you know the investment opportunity says it it becomes too wide and and then frankly what the wider you get the more you're just going to end up being less correlated or you become more correlated with just just broader you know private equity or just equities in general yeah and and moving on from that um the Many infrastructure traditionalists will be very hard asset focused, but um, given our discussions on on digitalization and, and Martin's observations around tokenization, to what extent are we moving to a world where more digital type assets or or asset like asset light infrastructure solutions begin to begin to play a, a, a role? So we, we've had a question around around cybersecurity, right? Um, to what extent would you consider um, uh, sort of cybersecurity companies uh, increasingly a, an essential part of, of a digital ecosystem to become part of, of infrastructure allocations? Um, you know, I'll happy to, to start on that one. I guess you could put me sort of in the infrastructure traditionalist bucket. Um, the uh, so the, the nice thing about hard assets uh, is just that the, the barriers to entry are very, very clear. And, you know, the, there's just a clear cost to, to developing certain assets. There's also just a clear, um, 
you know, there's there's no need, obviously, to develop a parallel, um, you know, uh, electricity network or water network. Uh, there's no need to build an airport right. We and you can't build an airport right next to another airport. So, the the physicality of the asset does provide a level of protection that um, that you don't necessarily don't necessarily get with um, sort of an asset light structure. Now, that's not to say. Um, there may not be a role for that, but you know you have to get very, very confident around the barriers to entry, and you get into this really interesting. You know, a lot of a lot of these companies uh, who are asset light, they they don't want to be regulated in a sense, but in a in a sense from our side, almost unless you're on the verge of being regulated, unless you have that kind of monopolistic position, then almost you're not infrastructure. So. In a sense, some of these companies they they may not actually want to be infrastructure because they don't want to see themselves as monopolies monopolies and and therefore um, have the the handcuffs that that puts around them. So I'm I'm generally yeah, colour me sceptical. It might might happen, but it's we we're, we're fairly wary of it. Hmm. Manoj, yeah, I, I don't really have much to add. You know, I mean, <laughs> since cybersecurity is a, a great business, I mean, you know, I'm sure all of us if we bought cybersecurity stocks. You know 10 15 years ago we um you know we'd be doing really well um it, you know it but but to, to to david's point you know it's it's still a competitive business it um obviously it's it, you can think of it just from a generic standpoint like the, it, there's an infrastructure of, of of a certain ecosystem you, you need to have like cyber security that, that that doesn't make sense but i think from a infrastructure as an investment asset class, I, I do think it's it is quite different. Um, and sure. you know, I think having that asset based approach is, um, you know, I, I think it's important um, in terms of how I think the market sort of looks at infrastructure and um, and what and what they want it to to you know how they want it to perform and, and deliver for their in terms of asset allocation. I, I don't think cybersecurity stocks. I think just the way they act and behave and in those businesses. You know they they should be in you know in 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 the technology you know software sector fair enough martin does that does that reflect your it, your it, it does yeah and i guess an analogy would be you know would you include the the outsource security company at the gates of your oil refineries checking the ids of of people going in and out so i think you know for us infrastructures is all about the assets and the cash flow um, ultimately so yeah, absolutely. Um, and I suppose when, when we think about more sort of connectivity, which which um, data centers could, could could be classified as, do, do we see similar dynamics in, in the tower sector? Or um, I, I get the sense that that towers are, are viewed slightly differently, given given a more monopolistic position, perhaps. Dave, David, I see you nodding. Yeah, I mean, they they've they've been a long standing part of the the sort of infrastructure slash listed infrastructure market um they're not proven ending their REIT structure well it, that's yeah <laughs> the 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 structure of them is sort of a, it, not irrelevant that's that's probably pushing it too too far but the the just because they're called REITs doesn't mean they i mean they can be included in your in your REIT portfolio as well uh, by all means um we're, we're not kind of like just hogging all, all the towers for ourselves um but they definitely qualify as infrastructure for sure. Um, they're proven over many years that they have a very strong monopolistic position. The the five G part is you know it's it's interesting to see some of that start to become a bit more competitive. But the the sort of core tower business is very defensive. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But um, so our discussions have 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 spoken to perhaps changing habits and and changing preferences infrastructure is by definition um, dependent on the users of that infrastructure. When we take a longer term view as, as infrastructure investors often are, to what extent can we see changing demographics and, and perhaps changing preferences, changing the, the usage and appetite for, for infrastructure over the longer term? Minaj, I'll, I'll shift that one to you first, if I may. Sure. Um... Yeah, well, I mean, I think you're, you're you're already starting to see it. Like you, you know, you don't. Th there's not a lot of new investment in, you know, I would say, 
you know, oil pipelines, right? You know, you see a lot of maintenance of existing, you know, oil pipelines and maybe, maybe some small, like, you know, some capacity additions, but you're not seeing any major, like kind of greenfield projects. And so, so I, I think parts of the market, um, I think have moved to maybe a maintenance mode and there is, you know, and again, this, this, this comes a little bit more dependent on the sector and the geography and, you know, and, you know, there are certain parts of the world that, you know, have from a policy standpoint, have made a very clear view towards electrification and, you know, time will tell if, if they can completely, um, you know, weed off themselves off of natural gas or other hydrocarbon, you know, based fuels. And, and, and so then there's a question mark on the kind of the terminal value of the infrastructure assets associated with it. And so I, and I think that, that will always sort of be the case and you're going to see that in, in, in certain, certain pockets. Um, and, you know, and, and it's obviously starting to creep even into, you know, transportation infrastructure, which, you know, we haven't spent a lot of time talking, but, you know, again, you know, with, with some of the, uh, particularly in Europe with, with some of the, the regulations, you know, on, on carbon emissions on, on airlines, like, you know, does that sort of put some kind of a cap, you know, in terms of, okay, the amount of, you know, airplane and, you know, airline usage, you know, you know, when you look, you know, you look 20, 30 years from now. Um, and so, and then, and then, then there's the, the whole demographic issue, right? And, you know, it's no secret, you know, a lot of the developed market, you know, populations are likely peaking or might have already peaked, um, you know, this some either between now and, and the end of the decade. And, and so, you know, you know, I, I think as an investor in infrastructure, you do need to sort of think about, you know, that the, those demo, that the factor of the demographics and and what does that mean for, you know, the, the, the terminal value, you know, of your asset and, and the growth opportunities, you know, for that asset. So, um, you know, I think this is the, these factors have always been relevant. I, I just think in now you know, because of kind of, again, the preferences, you know, towards, you know, decarbonization and, and, and you're starting to see sort of, you know, some population peaks in, in certain markets, it's becoming a bigger factor versus maybe 10, 15 years ago, no one thought about some of these things. They, they sort of applied a kind of a generic 2%, you know, growth assumption in their terminal year and, um, you know, for on a perpetual basis. And, and I think now, you know, you, you know, maybe, you know, it'd be, you know, you could think it's kind of dangerous to to make those assumptions um, if you're making investment, you know, towards a, a long duration asset like infrastructure. In certain geographies, certainly. D David, what are, what are your perspectives on that? Yeah, I think um, I guess one of the things about infrastructure is uh, if there is change, it should be pretty slow. Um, if if we're investing in assets that um, are expected to see significant shifts. Um, particularly in a negative direction, but even in a positive direction, um, I start to question whether that sort of has the, the characteristics. Maybe to approach the demographic question from a slightly different angle, and, and maybe here's my here's a pitch for the asset class, which is one of the interesting things about this demographic shift is you are really getting a, you know, people moving into retirement and becoming much more aware of the need for asset or sort of... Um, the protection of their their um, you know their pension, and you know do you really? I think that this is where infrastructure can play a really important role as we move into like a you know an older a sort of an aging population. Is we you know it's an asset class that delivers better returns than you know the, well can deliver better returns than say fixed income. Uh, but at the same time, just gives you that, that that gradual growth. And again, it harks back to that. That's why it's very important that we maintain discipline around the asset class, um, because if we are to provide that stable long term, you know, asset protection or investment protection, um, that's it becomes important that we're, we're in, and going to Minaj's point, it, it's important that we're investing in assets that will be there in 20 or 30 years. Um, and that we have confidence over that. So I guess that's my take on the demographic issue. Sure. Yeah. No. Yeah. And, and maybe maybe one thing to sort of add to further David's comments is that, you know, particularly on the listed side, you know, the market has 
adjusted to the new interest rate world, right? Um, and, um, and, and I think that if someone is looking to invest in the infrastructure, you want to, you do also want to make sure that you're investing in today's cost of capital environment, um, which I think, you know, reflects one, one, just higher nominal rates, but obviously, you know, maybe a higher forward, you know, inflation view. And so, um, and, and so I think that's where, you know, again, to be able to kind of, you know, get the kind of characteristics and the expectations that you would look for an infrastructure assets, you, you do want to make sure that, you know, at least your, you know, your cost basis or, or how you're investing, you know, reflects that on a, on a going forward basis. And, and I would say that, you know, clearly, you know, I think list infrastructure has had some challenges the last couple of years and sort of, and some of it has just been just digesting just, just a much higher, you know, rate environment, but, but that, that adjustment's now been made. Um, and so, you know, the value, you know, the valuations you're seeing out there reflects the, the current rate environment and a much, you know, higher, you know, forward rate environment. Um, um, and, and you're not like sort of stuck in maybe some legacy, you know, sort of um, views of our um, ways that th these assets were valued maybe a handful of years ago when we were at, you know, close to zero, you know, zero percent interest rates. So more more attractive prospective returns available from uh, from infrastructure today. What we what we haven't touched on so much is is geographic diversification, and I, I think that um, again maybe leaning to infrastructure traditionalists tend to focus on on developed markets. But given our comments on on demographic changes over over the long term, maybe a question for you, Martin. How how have you considered? The, the geographic diversification within within index construction and, and and the growth in emerging markets for for infrastructure. Yeah, and no, absolutely, and I guess you know the emerging markets not 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 got its own uh, demographic problems as well. If you if you look at China, for example, but um, we we have a global universe of of equity stocks, and and so we've we've looked at both emerging and developed. Um, I guess currently, if you were to look at the market cap. Um, weight of developed at sort of 90, 95 percent of the sort of the, the infrastructure world when only sort of five, 10 percent in that emerging market world. But what you do see, there are um, particular styles of companies that you appear more often in the, in the emerging market, particularly in the transport um, area um, that you don't see. And, and I guess that, you know, some of that may be a, a regulatory effect in the sense that you know, they, they can build things, you know, particularly in China, they just build railways, right, or build airports, and, and then those get listed um, publicly, so so get captured more easily. Um, and, and perhaps the time to market is, is shorter for, for infrastructure projects in, in the emerging world as well. Um, you know, but from a listed perspective, you know, once once they're listed um, from from an indexing point of view, then then we 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 will capture that and capture that change in and in, in evolution in, in the infrastructure world. Um, but it doesn't, you know, it does come with its own challenges, particularly on the on the regulatory front, for example, knowing what uh, utilities are you know producing power in a in a regulated manner versus an unregulated manner, which is you know an attractive thing to to be aware of for, for the investor or requirement even from a compliance perspective so you know it's not it has its own unique set of challenges but if, if you just sort of to ignore that then you know it, it's there and it, it gets captured e easily enough i think yeah absolutely and then perhaps that also speaks to the liquidity um on offer as well which is which is increasingly important to to institutional investors but but also to um to managers of of listed infrastructure portfolios, right? Do we think that um, as as we see new technology uh, be, be becoming more prevalent in in infrastructure opportunity sets, that there remains a, a liquidity challenge there, given the the size of, of of many companies in in that opportunity set? Perhaps some some comments on liquidity would be would, would be interesting to hear. Um. Yeah, it's, a good, it's an interesting question. I think there's two elements to liquidity. One is, um, you know, to the extent the extent to which you can get in and out of a stock and, you know, the develop, well, I think for, um, I guess, Minaj would be probably in a similar boat, um, but we, we don't really find that many liquidity challenges to get. I mean, with the exception of maybe one or two stocks in our universe, you know, everything else we can, we can find a fair bit of liquidity. Um, 
this is this is always interesting actually for investors who are new to the um, new to the the infrastructure market. Uh, I think they're always quite su positively surprised about actually you know you can pretty much get you know a hundred million dollars is pretty pretty easy to get into or out of um, you know a portfolio. So that's uh, that's a pretty you know you do have a fair bit of liquidity there. One of the things that we are seeing is actually just a demand for well just a, a quite significant capital raisings um, and this goes all the way back to some of the stuff that we talked about with um, you know the rollout of electrification with other developments in the listed infrastructure market whether it's renewables or um, you know some of the data center stuff there's just actually quite a significant demand or that these companies are raising quite a lot of capital and that's provided us with some really good entry opportunities into some of these companies who are doing I mean National Grid just did a um did a raise we had pinnacle west a few weeks ago and it, like it's almost every week we we're starting to see um people come to market and that's just constantly increasing the volume of um you know or the asset or the sort of the market cap of this this sector so you know look the liquidity is something that we there's there's quite a bit there and actually there's a lot of opportunities for for that to grow over time and just beside before i hand to you Manoj, um the other thing that we're seeing from our clients, uh, as you mentioned, Tom, on the in institutional side, some of them are getting more to sort of an at-weight position in their infrastructure allocations, but they've also been investing for the best part of 10 or 15 years now, and they're starting to get capital returns from some of the early funds or some of the early assets that they invest in. Um, and on, on the private side. On the private side, yeah. Uh, and so we find that we're actually provide we can provide us a, a source of uh, liquidity i guess where they, they they get capital back and then they need to stick that somewhere in the infrastructure world for a while uh and we've been able to demonstrate i think that we can be we can take that capital uh deploy it quickly and then if they if they deploy it somewhere else we can give that capital back and that's actually where listed infrastructure is a really useful tool and in a portfolio yeah, man, I was just... Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I would probably say the same things that, that David said. You know, I think, um, you know, I think, I think investors are now hopefully starting to appreciate. You know, I think the value of liquidity. You know, given how you know we have seen a bit of a slowdown in sort of the monetizations or you know just liquidity of the private side and um, having. Part of your allocation, whether it's to infrastructure, or real estate, or, or other asset classes, it, in a liquid form, I think gives you a lot of flexibility in being able to manage you know, your allocations, being able to manage you know capital calls and 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 monetizations, um, and also allows you to take advantage of of windows and opportunities. Um, you know, and they don't come you know they don't come every you know few weeks, but you know I think. Over the course of a cycle, you know, five, seven year cycle, yeah, there, there's always there's always a few windows where you can um, take advantage of, you know, maybe some volatility in, in the marketplace that, you know, had an impact on the price, the, the price of, of this infrastructure companies, but it didn't change the value of these companies and and, and you can sort of take advantage of, of, of those situations. And so um, so I, again, I, I think the, the value of liquidity is 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 really important and 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 i think obviously you know naturally david and i are biased but you know we, we think that uh, you know everyone should have have uh, some of that in their in their infrastructure allocation all right well manoj david martin thank you very much for a, a broad ranging discussion covering all sorts of topics uh, under the umbrellas of uh, digitalization decarbonization and deglobalization um, there's plenty more to cover, but uh, your insights have been very interesting to uh, to hear this afternoon uh, for me anyway. Uh, thank you very much to participants for taking the time to join us today. And we wish you a good rest of the day. Thank you. Okay. Thank nice you. Thanks, guys.